What is up guys, Lord Nick here, bringing you another League of Legends related video. This is the 21st episode of the Dangerous Game Podcast. Um, yeah, I know I said I was going to be doing these more regularly. Well, I ran out of things that I wanted to talk about. Legitimately, I changed roles and I had a lot of things I didn't really want to talk about. I didn't really want to focus on LCS stuff because I felt like that's being overdone and some of the best, you know, some of the things that I did best was talking about different topics that were more pertaining to the average person. But to be honest, I really don't have too much that I want to left to talk about, so I'm going back to the LCS talk here. Um, and as for today, specifically, I'm going to be talking about one of my favorite teams. Um, they started off as my favorite team last year and the years before that. They were in the league, and that was Clutch Gaming. They are now Dignitas. And they've maintained being one of my favorite teams nonetheless, just because I'm trying to keep kind of an org allegiance of some sort or another. Um, I've in the past kind of moved around to different teams and stuff like that. They also had Hooney on it, and I really like Hooney still. Um, I, 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 I'm gonna get more in depth on Hooney himself uh, here in a bit. We're gonna kind of talk in this episode. I kind of wanted to break down Dignitas's last this last split, um, what you know news that we've received for the next split, and what we're gonna be kind of uh, kind of expecting hopefully to see this next split some predictions as to what I think Dignitas is going to do. This isn't all about the LCS, this is specifically about Dignitas, pertaining specifically to Dignitas. So, to get started, guys, let's talk about um, Dignitas slash Clutch Gaming, kind of as a little recap thing for anybody who's not aware. Um, for any of you who didn't watch League last year, in case you happen to be a new person, and you, you just happen to see Dignitas, and you're like, oh, these guys are pretty cool, um, I really highly doubt it. Most of the people that are going to like it are going to be veterans that know the players that are veterans on that team and are like, oh, yeah, sweet. Uh, maybe, but maybe you caught an interview with Huni and you thought, oh, my God, this guy's funny. I'm going to vote for – I'm going to go for his team now. Um, let's kind of introduce you a little bit to what they did beforehand. So previously this roster was a uh, roster of NA Talents and Huni, along with one old dog jungler from Korea – who hadn't found too much success in Korea and kind of moved around. You know, he found a little bit of early success back in the early days. His name was Lyra. Um, and then he'd been in NA for, gosh, almost six years, I think. No, no, a little less than, probably about five years. Um, about five years in NA and had found minimal success until last summer. His team got into the playoffs you know, as a middle ground team that nobody was counting on, Clutch Gaming. And Clutch Gaming uh, roster at the time was Huni in the top lane, Lyra in the jungle, Damante, a up-and-coming uh, North American mid laner, uh, Cody Sun, a relatively newish uh, EDC in the bot lane. He'd been around for about maybe a year or two prior to that with the only real note was that in his first split he made it in his first year they made it to worlds but then he flopped really hard and so a lot of people called him Cody Dunn and nobody thought he was actually good anymore which was completely wrong he's proven that time and time again now um, and then lastly you have Vulcan a rookie support who uh, is now uh, Cloud9's uh, support and they just won uh, the NA split, you know, NA LCS this last split, and he was easily the best support in the league. So, if we're looking at that team, nobody was really counting on this team. You have a supposedly overhyped ADC, a new mid laner who had some promise but wasn't like particularly great, uh, a rookie support who nobody had any real faith or knowledge of, and then a jungler who had never seen really any success, and Huni, who was kind of coming off of a really bad couple of splits. So this team, middle of the split, gets bought out by Dignitas, and they all of a sudden, with the new management and changes that Dignitas made to the whole organization of the team, just turn around and become a dominative force. They make it into playoffs, start doing really well in playoffs, and then actually make it to the finals in playoffs, which was nuts beyond all doubt. They, nobody expected this. Took second place, which gave them a chance to go into the gauntlet. They go into the gauntlet now, and they had taken the top team to five games. They go into the gauntlet, and they just crush through the gauntlet. They just roll through the gauntlet, and they make it. They make it this miracle run. 
through the gauntlet in two worlds as the third place team for North America. They then get rolled in their group. Uh, well, they have to then, as the third place team, go through the the lower phase of it the, to kind of qualify into the group stage. And they did that. They, they dominate through, they get in. Now, they unfortunately get placed into what is called the Group of Death. And the Group of Death last year, for those that didn't see Worlds, was a horrible, horrible chance for Clutch Gaming to get out of that group. You had RNG, which was the most notable LPL team coming in. They were not first place in LPL. That was actually Phoenix, uh, Fun Plus Phoenix, which nobody was really talking about. Um, though they did really well in China and were seen as the best team in China, they hadn't had any like fame outside of China. The, the you know if you didn't watch the LPL, you didn't know who the hell they were. Um, and so you have RNG though, which Royal Never Give Up has Uzi, the arguably best ADC in the world, along with a ragged hat with a team of just ungodly strong. Uh, was it RNG? Oh, now I'm thinking about it. It might have been IG on that team. One second. I have to look that up now. Now I'm making myself second guess because I had the Chinese team there. So just one second. This is kind of embarrassing, but let me look it up real quick here. Worlds 2019. Group of death. So SKT1. So it was Royal Never Give Up. Okay, I thought so. So SKT won the three-time world champions from Korea with, you know, prodigy mid laner Faker along with legendary teammates on his team of Khan, one of the most notable top laners in, in Korea, Clid, an up-and-coming amazing jungler, Teddy, one of the the best ADC in Korea for three year, for three splits straight, who just recently moved over to, to SKT, and then Mata, a legendary and acclaimed support player. Okay, amazing, amazing team. Royal never give up. The guys who had won pretty much everything this year, or pretty much everything the year before, they had won uh, three straight huge tournaments the year before. They were doing really well domestically. They were known as the one of the biggest favorites coming in for World's Run. Fnatic the second place team out of Europe, the team who arguably had, outside of G2, had the best chance from the West to take Worlds. And then next up, you have Clutch Gaming. Um, which was just an unfortunate placement for them. Um, literally, there was one other team that if they had beaten... So let's see, I think if, if Splice had lost in their attempt to get into the group stages then uh, C9 would have taken Splice's spot in their group and actually done probably better, or cl C9, Clutch Gaming would have been put into the Splice spot and done arguably better just because Clutch actually still showed they were a world-class caliber team. They went 0-6, and six, but in a group that nobody expected anything from, they had four out of those six games come down to a final team fight that if they just played, if they just positioned just a slight bit better, just done a little bit different things in one of those fights, they would have won that game. You know, they put these three world-class top of the frickin' world teams into a position where they almost could not win. Like, that's impressive in and of itself. Zero and six doesn't look impressive, but when you analyze each of the games, they played really, really well. Anyhow, that's the team that used to be Dignitas. Now, come into the 2020 spring split, Dignitas decides to make it a uh, interesting choice. Instead of keeping these NA talents who were looking to stay with the team, instead of keeping their Korean jungler who was now on a resurgence and becoming one of the best jung like becoming a world's caliber jungle again, like he had been in the past, who had seen himself now have a fire lit under him, this determination and ability to show that he is still a really good player. Their top laner, who is returning to form, they're just all these amazing players that were starting to just show that they were the 
potentially in the race for the best in their role. Dignitas decides, no, we're going to sell our support Vulcan to Cloud9, one of always arguably the best teams in North America. We're going to sell our ADC to 100 Thieves. Uh, we're going to let Lyra go. We just don't want him anymore. Not even offering to trade him anywhere. Not even offering to sell him. They literally just terminated his contract. His contract was near its end anyways, but they just terminated it and said goodbye. You can do what you want to do. And off he goes. And then DeMonte, you don't even get really not. You can go ahead and look around for a team, bud. Uh, but you're free to go. You're no longer on the roster. So... You know, they originally offered him to just go to their academy team right off the bat. He didn't want that. He's like, oh, you know what? One of these other teams is going to pick me up for sure. There's a lot of other teams coming into the league. I just proved I'm a world-class mid laner. I held my own against three of the best mid laners in the world. Obviously, somebody's going to pick him up. Nobody did. All these other teams put gambles on these unknown stupid players, and it was just mind-boggling that he didn't make it on the team. Note, he is not the like best mid laner in the world. I really like DeMonte. His personality, the character behind who he is, is amazing. And the dedication he puts into becoming as good as he is is amazing. And just the skill that he brings behind odd picks and sticking to picks that he likes, rather than fitting and forming specifically to how the meta plays, is a very interesting take on it. And I very much respect that a lot more, Making kind of making his own meta and demanding his own you know, bands just based off of the fact of how he plays kind of reminds me of old back in the day Froggen and a couple of the other big mid laners. And that, that to me is just a lot of personality the role has lost over the years um, that he brought to it. And I really liked that. But I don't think he is arguably like mechanically just so better than everybody else that he's a god tier mid laner. Just to kind of get that out there. Anyhow, Dignitas ditches all these guys except for Huni. They keep Huni. Because Huni is a giant brand. Huni brings in a lot of fans. Huni also just came off one of the best splits he'd had since pre SKT Huni. Like back when he was a world caliber top laner, this was the guy, right? Like, so he just showed that he could go back to that form, right? So they signed him for $2.3 million, arguably one, one third of their budget. Now, this is speculated. This is never. And this was also speculated to be guaranteed. Recently, the. The, the CEO of DIG says, no, 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 it was not guaranteed. Uh, I don't know where you, your source got this information. It's not guaranteed, yada, yada, yada. The reason he brings that up is that Huni was told at the end of this split he is allowed almost like two or three days after they got knocked out of playoff contention. Huni is allowed to look for other teams. I'm not, I'm not kidding. They Literally, the first round of playoffs had not even started yet, and they were already saying Huni's good to go. See you later, Huni. Like... I get it. Huni had a really bad split this split, but, like, damn. It was super fast after they lost their last game that Huni was allowed to go and see other teams. Look for other teams. Which, based off of that split, he, even though Huni's a huge name, there's a chance he won't find a team that actually wants him as, like, their starter without splitting time with somebody, potentially. But let's look at their new roster, right? Because I'm kind of jumping ahead today in this split. Let's look at the split itself. Who's on their actual roster? Well, their roster is, com is committed to being filled with three really well-known veterans. One well-known jungler, but not well-known for a good reason, and then an unknown ADC. So let's look at the other two veterans. We've already said Huni. We've established Huni's paid a shit ton. And Huni is, of course, Huni, so a lot of people know who that is. And I'm not going to break down who Huni is in any way, shape, or form for anybody. If you're interested in Huni, go look Huni up. It's You'll find a lot of entertaining videos and interviews with him. Um, anyhow, let's look at Froggen, their new mid laner, who is an ex-world-class, considered world-class mid laner, one of the best mid laners in the world back in Season 2 and 3 and 4. That was the last time he was considered anything. Now he's an NA mid laner who has had no success in North America, really. At all. He had one really dominative split. Then, a hand, then all the ones in between, now and then, had been crap. This split was middling to fair. You know, a lot of people can argue he had a really good split. A lot of people could argue he had a great split. Some people could argue he had a trash split. Depending on how you're looking at it, is eh. I think he had a relatively okay split. He was put on a lot of champions that he was not comfortable on, and it obviously showed. But when he was on his comfort picks... Man played 
so, so well. Anyhow, that's who Froggen is. That's all you need to know who Froggen is. Because there's nothing else about Froggen you really need to know other than maybe he's a big voice and he kind of demands a lot of resources. But he's also kind of used to playing without them. Like at this point in his career, he's pretty used to being a resource light mid laner, which can be very good for their jungle to put pressure on Huni. Let's also talk about their support first. We'll get to their jungle last, actually. We'll touch up on the jungle last. We'll even touch the ADC first. Support. X, best support in North America, three or four years in a row, Afromu. And I say X best because he's been on a downward tear for the last two years. He had kind of a little bit of resurgence in summer. Not great, though. Comes over to Dig. This looks like the team that's going to turn it around, right? He's got so many amazing players who have not been, like, that are not toxic. They're not so cocky about themselves. That they're going to just argue with the team. Sure, they demand a lot of resources to themselves to a degree. But these are all been... Huni's been known as somewhat becoming a team player. He didn't used to be, but he definitely switched it up quite a bit in North America. Froggen's known as a team player. He's played on so many super teams. He's been known to be a team player. So, you know, Afrimu, this kind of headstrong, cocksure guy of knowing how to run the game at, from the support role, could definitely lock into this team, right? It's, you know, you have the three big heads of this team are going to be Huni, Froggen, and Afrimu. Right now, I could see them clicking. On paper, I could see them clicking at the beginning of the season. I'm looking at it, and I'm like, that's a pretty solid core right there. Who are your other two? Johnson. I have no idea who this kid is. He's a Canadian ADC coming straight out of TSM Academy. That's all I know about him. That's all anybody knew about him. Unproven, don't know what he's going to do. Do I think he can do really well, though? Possibly. I don't know. I'm, I'm really hoping, you know, the last rookie that, you know, Clutch Gaming slash Dig gambled on with Vulcan, and he did excellent. So, let's see. You know what? I'm going to tip my hat if he does. I have no real expectation of him, but he's with Afrimu, so it can't be that terrible, right? That's all we have to know about him. The last guy is who I'm going to spend the most time talking about, and not in a good way. So let me drink some water, and I'm going to dump right into this. So the last person on the Dignitas 2020 lineup is arguably the stupidest, worst potential waste of a slot I have ever seen in the history of fucking League of Legends roster moves. Legitimately, they could have kept Lyra. In no way, shape, or form was Lyra demanding a gigantic fucking paycheck. In no way, shape, or form was Lyra saying, I'm not going to play for you guys anymore because I think you guys are absolutely stupid or that your organization doesn't know how to manage itself. Because obviously, he just made it to Worlds because of the organizational changes made by this team. Team decides to abandon this jungler, who, yes, arguably not the best jungle potentially out there but definitely definitely at least four to five steps ahead of the jungler they decided to go with now supposedly there were some type of roster fuck-ups that happened in the offseason people that they were supposed to pick up either decided not to play in their split or got offers from another team and actually signed with that other team much faster and quicker than they were initially supposed to sign with dignitas like there are some supposed mess-ups in that regard no names were ever given Obviously, because what happened was is that they spent too much money on Hootie and they didn't actually think about who they were going to fill out the rest of the team with. So anyhow, Dignitas picks up the one, the only, TSM Grig. No, I say one and only, but a lot of you are probably asking, uh, who? Any of you who didn't watch LCS or asking, I don't, or saying, I've never heard this name in any real way, shape, or form, right? You, you know, any of you who are looking for big names from NALCS have no fucking idea who Grig is. Unless, unless you are a TSM fan in which you're like, oh, really? And you're not saying, oh, really, as 
Congratulations. No, you're saying oh really as why. So TSM, if you're not familiar with them, is notorious for burning out junglers and burning through them. Predominantly great junglers get wasted on TSM. They go to TSM, they get just demolished, and they lose a lot of confidence in themselves and become less than adequate players. Note, I say most junglers because there is at least one exception to this rule, and that is TSM Grig. Now, Grig was picked up by TSM a couple splits beforehand. Nobody knew who the hell this kid was. He came in as a rookie, showed that he had some okay mechanics, and wasn't the fault of TSM in his first split. He didn't lose them the games. He didn't lose them all the problems. He just didn't win them anything either. So, neutral jungle was kind of an okay pick for TSM then, right? Like, he's not costing them games. He's not winning them games. He's really just kind of a body in a chair. It's not the worst thing. TSM kind of needed a body in a chair in their jungle. They had a lot of really strong opinions on that team. A body in a chair just guarantees having a person there that's going to do the things his team says, does, you know, sticks with everybody, and as long as he's being directed, he's got a tool to do the things you need him to do. The problem with that is that TSM started changing their team, and there wasn't a very big leading voice anymore. And uh, Grig just mechanically was being outdone by the junglers who could think for themselves, who had macro play, who had map understanding, who had knowledge of what the hell they're supposed to do. And he decided to show up with his pre-kindergarten fucking IQ of five and just decide, you know what? I'm going to just, like, power farm my jungle. Except I'm not going to power farm my jungle. I'm going to take, like, three camps and go look for a gank on the side of the map that's supposed to be our weak side of the map and give up objectives on the other side of the map. Or I'm going to try to do a 2v1 dive on their top lane when my top laner has no CC or burst potential in the early game and really doesn't want me to do this. I'm going to take aggro with one tower shot, repel on my Elise so that my top laner then takes aggro, come back down and attack the person as my top laner now has to burn flash to try to get out. I don't get the kill. I get stunned. Tower shoots me and I die. This was the epitome of what Grig's performance looked like in many, many scenarios on TSM. Mind you, this is not a confident feel that I feel in this person. Up until this point, I'm looking at TSM, I'm like, damn, or I'm looking at Dignitas' lineup of the four people I'd seen before Grig. I'm thinking, damn, okay, maybe they did upgrade from our NA talent that they had before. These guys were up-and-comers, these guys were good, but, like, damn, they got some really strong veterans. They got an unknown rookie that can be molded to what the team needs as an ADC, which is, who's not going to have a big head, who's not going to think he needs all the resources, which means they can play around Hooney if they have a strong jungle synergy. They can have a jungle that plays around Hooney or Froggen, and Aphromoo is just down there taking the resources from the ADC. Like, damn, I could see this working out. This could end up being really, really good. They just need a strong mental game jungler who is also just aggressive and good at going for fights, right? You know, like, Dardoch's going to TSM. We all know that. So that guy's out of the picture. You know, I wouldn't want him because he has a lot of weak points, and I always argue Dardoch shouldn't be in the league anymore, but people are arguing, well, he's mechanically great. And I was like, yeah, but he's kind of an idiot who's also hot-headed. There's a lot of downsides to the positive that he's just, like, a mechanical god. He just doesn't have the macro for the role. Like, that's besides the point. That's a completely different topic. We'll get to that topic on another day, another video, maybe. But, like, if we're looking at who they could have grabbed for the jungle, right? There's options. Okay, go beg Lyra. Lyra went to, to Korea to try to get on a Korean team. He's gonna end up on the subpar second tier Korean team. Okay, like... Maybe if you offer him a little bit more money than he was making before, he'd be willing to come back. He's got synergy with Huni. You're going to show him that he has some really world-class caliber, world caliber teammates. Like, it could work, right? Like, he doesn't have to change his strategy from the last play. He just focuses on helping Huni and helping out the mid lane. Like, this could work, right? Or maybe, hey, let's pick up Acadian, the guy that TSM was trying to do the TSM 
jungle symptom too, where they're trying to just like burn them out and blow them out and throw them out of the window. Acadian's good. You know what? Let's pick up Acadian. Let's put him on our academy roster that we have an ungodly amount of veterans on. Fuck it. Let's put him. Let's put Lorlo on that team. Let's put Demonte in the mid lane there. Let's put Altec as our ADC. Or Al no, Phoenix as our ADC for whatever reason. And then screw it. We'll put Ole as our. Was it Ole? I think it was Ole. Maybe Adrian. Adrian or Ole, one of the two, as our support. Like, man, that looks like an LCS squad right there, if I've already looked at something. But let's say, for our starting jungler, let's get Grig. The guy that also just suffered an injury and got benched. The guy who's talked about being benched for Acadian just because he was sucking, not even just because of his injury. Then he had an injury, and that was the excuse they used to not put him back on the roster when he was better. Let's get him. That saves us a shit ton of money. Let's get Greg in here. He'll do fine. First couple of games, hey, it's working out real well. He's listening to the team. He's doing what the team needs him to do. The team's evolving. The team's building a strategy. The people on the team are building an identity. And Greg is still a, um... Well... Let's just say he's a rock, and there's a sculpture inside him. But what you got to chisel that sculpture out of him is a fucking wooden toothpick and a nail file. Good luck. Have fun. Like, I just don't get it. I just don't understand it. There's nothing I can really say other than this guy has shown time and time again he is a lackluster jungle in the at the best of it like he doesn't have a voice he doesn't have an opinion he doesn't have a thought process as to what he thinks is the best way to play the game and he doesn't even learn what his teammates think is the best way to play the game and play around that he doesn't know how to put pressure he doesn't know how to think for objectives he doesn't know how to ward he doesn't know how to just like he just doesn't seem to be trying is the worst part of it like and then to get to look at him, you find out he's trying his ass off. And it's just, I don't hate the guy for who he is. I just hate the fact that he's in the LCS. Because macro and game understanding wise, I'm like eight fucking chest steps ahead of him. And I'm a gold jungler. I'm a motherfucker who has no chance to ever get to the LCS. And yet I'm looking at him and I'm thinking to myself, how the fuck? fuck is he even there i've played people in solo queue that have a greater understanding of what league of legends is as a game as a whole than what the fuck grig is doing it's as if you ask somebody on deviant art to make you one of their amazing amazing pictures you've seen this guy's work you're like oh my god i need you to make me a picture dude i really want this picture commissioned by you and they're like yeah sure i got you bro and then in return, you paid him this two to three hundred dollars for this commission piece, and you get this Crayola crayon thing that you know looks identical to what you were looking for. Exception is that it's in fucking crayon, and you can tell it's in crayon. And if you ever fucking touch it, it just smears and breaks. And you're just like, I can't honestly be that mad at it because it's doing what I it it it's exactly what I wanted to a degree. Um. But it's in crayon. Like, that's that's honestly how I feel this grid. He, he does what you ask him to do. But there's nothing... You're not getting a deal on this. You're not, like... You're not getting ahead on this. Like, he's just gonna do what you tell him to do. And that's not good. You need... That role specifically needs somebody who thinks for themselves. So they, middle of the season, switch him out for Acadian, which is hilarious in, like dramatic irony type of way due to the fact that like that's exactly who he got swapped for on TSM and it was proven that Acadian was the better jungler and then this time around it is proven that Acadian's the better jungler again which is a sad dramatic it's just a tragedy on Acadian's spot like that he didn't get the starting spot because Grig was there for whatever reason they just decided like Grig was the better choice to put there even though they had both him and Acadian the entire fucking season 
Like, I just don't understand the reasoning of, like, giving this guy a chance. Like, you obviously could tell by, like, just a slight bit of, like, YouTubing even. Not even, I don't even say fucking researching the situation. You just go look at YouTube videos of a play-by-play -play of almost identical team compositions with Akkadian opposed to Grig and just see how much smoother it went for them. It's, it's just mind-boggling to think that they would put Grig in when they had the guy who replaced him for a reason. Now, that being said, team almost made it to playoffs once they put Acadian in. They almost made a comeback. It was pretty impressive. But anyhow, at the end of the, like I said earlier in the video, at the end of the split, they told Hooney, see you later, like three days after they lost. So now Hooney's going to be gone. Grig is obviously not going to be on the starting roster. We know that for a freaking fact, or we should know that for a freaking fact. There's no way this guy can be that good of a smooth-talking son of a gun to get himself, like, to lie himself into a position. This is a dude that has his resume typed up on fucking notepad with no indication. Like, it just says, like, any LCS jungler in big, bold fucking letters. And they're just like, yeah. Like, fuck yeah, look, it even says it. It's like he has a fucking fake card that says authorized by Riot or something. Like, I have no understanding how he's talked himself into the position before. There's no fucking way he can do it again. But let's say they don't go looking for a new jungle. They decide to keep with Akkadian, which I think is a smart move. Akkadian has proven himself to be not a top NALCS talent, but a doable NALCS talent with a little bit of direction, a little bit of coaching, a little bit of help, and a little bit of time to work with his team. I think he can produce good results. I think they have a chance to make it a world with him as their jungler. Not, you know, particularly like he's going to carry them or anything, but he will get the job done and he'll do it well enough to show that he is not a bad choice or person to put faith in. And he'll help the team grow. He'll allow the team to develop the style that they want to play and he will fit it and he will do it. That's something that Grig will not do. Grig will do it as long as somebody is constantly micromanaging the shit out of him. Acadian will learn how his team plays and play to them. So off my soapbox about the jungle they keep with Acadian let's say the rest of the pieces stay the same too they're going to keep Aphromu and Johnson Johnson had an amazing split Aphromu had middling to fair he died a lot he didn't really make a lot of plays but his job to split looked definitely like a uh, block for <laughs> block for Johnson type of split he played a lot of Tom Gench and when he was on Tom Gench he actually played pretty well he played Thresh a couple times to get Johnson out, not really to make the plays. I think Afro Move really needed this type of split to kind of help him kind of realize, you know what, I've kind of changed who I am as a player. My mentality's changed. Maybe this is the style I need to play more. Maybe he'll switch it back up to being the super, super stylistic Afro Move now that he's got time built with Johnson. I think the bot lane is fine. And I think Froggen is doable. And I think he can, you know, if you just keep him on those control mages, he's going to perform and he's going to show you that he is still to par on that specific pick style. So now you're looking at a team fight oriented comp. Acadian can play into team fights. Aphromoo and Johnson can definitely play into team fights. What are you looking for in a top laner and who are you looking at? That's the last thing we're covering on this video. I know this video is going longer than most of my podcast. So I want to talk about this one as in depth and briefly as I possibly can. But let's look into what do we think is going to be the best optimal pick for them. And to be perfectly blunt and honest, that's a hard decision right now. There's not anybody you're going to snipe from other teams right now, right? Like, you can probably get Viper, but that's not a good pick. There's a reason he's getting benched from Blackwest. Um... And I honestly would hope to God they don't go for him. They could go for Dokla, which is, not, again, not somebody who I think should be back in there. So if you're looking at, like, Academy, right? If you're looking at Academy, Lorlo has been a guy in the past who could do it. But let's look at overall NA Academy top players, right? Because I had a hot take for it. But to be honest, that's contingent on people becoming discontent with the teams that they're currently on. And so, if you're looking at somebody, I think you can look at either Fudge, 
who is a C9 Academy from OCE, who has proven in OCE that he is a really good top laner. <coughs> Sorry for the cough. Brandini is okay. You can look at Revenge from the FlyQuest Academy. I think Revenge is actually not a bad player. I don't think he's a phenomenal player. And previously when he'd been in the LCS, I don't think he was like a top tier, but he could potentially do the job for you. Um, Darshan, if you wanted to go with another big name, he did kind of flop in the past, but he could potentially do better now. Again, it's really kind of up to you on that one there. Uh, Lorem is a guy who, again, looks like he wants to be doing good, but really hasn't proven himself. And then you have Jenkins, who is supposedly some type of, like, solo queue, pretty awesome top laner. But again, like, you don't really know if he can prove himself there. So I think your best option oddly enough, is going for Fake God, a guy who's had a little bit of ability on the stage, and who is an any talent, who's not like a god in any way, shape, or form, but he is a doable and serviceable top laner who filled in for someday, one of the best top laners in a long time. So, if you're looking at Fake God, do you, what do you think is good about Fake God, right? Like, what do I think is good about this player? And legitimately, when you look in his spring play, when he was on, or back in his summer play, when he was on the roster that had Amazing on the team for, uh, what's their freak, what's their name, 100 Thieves, he actually performed exactly how the team needed him to. He wasn't a carry, he wasn't some type of god, but he legitimately stalled out his position so well that the rest of the team was able to pop off and start doing really, really well, and they almost made a run to playoffs again. They were very close to making that really good run to playoffs, and, like, a big part of that's amazing, but, like, Fake God also was just a solid rock player that season. He wasn't a god, like his name might say, but he was a solid, serviceable top laner, which is not what Huni is. Huni is definitely a coin flippy top laner. You don't want to keep putting your faith in a guy who is either going to have a god tier split or have a god, like a terrible split. This is kind of the problem that Caps is forming into. Now, Caps has more ups than he has downs in many cases, but there's a lot of predictable ways to get him. Now, Caps is becoming very predictable on how you can get him into his craps moments. So he went from being this, you know, new baby faker to potentially one of the stupidest fucking mid lane slash ADCs in the world. You don't have that problem with Fake God. Fake God plays to the meta. Now, while I'm not a big fan of meta slaves to a degree, he plays to the meta in a way that he is just going to be able to not beat it, or refine it, or even carry in it. But he doesn't let himself get beaten up by it. He doesn't let himself fall into this trap of like having to dominate in whatever the meta is. He just plays to it, which means he's going to not potentially carry your team, but he's not going to be the person that destroys your team, which is kind of what Grig was supposed to be in the jungle. The problem is, is the role that Grig is in doesn't service that type of player. Top lane, on the other hand, has jokingly been referred to as the island, the place that you leave your player behind to just kind of do their own thing. And if you're looking at Acadian, what can make his day easier is working around the two people that are veteran voices on the team, and then learning how to play more around them in, the, in this next split, you have a guy who is okay being weak side top lane who could who has now been proven in the past to be able to play tanks and play kind of uh, less you know needed you know assistance in the top. He's also proven to be a really good Aatrox player. He's been in needy ochre. Um, Gangplank. He hasn't really won a game on a Gangplank, but he hasn't really been the reason they lost on him either. Um, he's been, again, serviceable on Renekton and Set. Again, not really won on either of these champions, but not, again, not the person that caused the loss. Um, but his Aatrox is phenomenal, which means that there's going to potentially be a ban pulled from him in which you stick him on, like, Orn duty, and he's just going to sit there and do his job or you sit him on, like, Mordekaiser and, again, do his job, like, you can put him on certain champions and he will do his job, and then if you want to give him resources, he actually has proven that he knows how to use those resources effectively. 
So all in all, you can have this guy who's a serviceable top laner when you need him to just be kind of a body in a seat. But if you put time and effort into building him up, can actually do really, really well. So I think, honestly, if they are looking to just be fast and quick, because they can't even get imports in FYI either. Like, with the lockdown and everything going on right now, there's no way they're going to get a new import in. So Huni leaving the team seems kind of unrealistic, but to a degree, like, I don't think you move Lorlo up. Lorlo hasn't really proven himself enough in the Academy to be become like god tier better than Huni. Uh, he is statistically good. He's not statistically great. Um, so I think you then move in like you know, okay, you're not going to move Lorlo up, so what are you going to take? I think you try to get Big God. He's on an academy team. I doubt 100 Thieves is just going to be like, no, you can't have him. I think, honestly, you could probably get him for way less than what you pay for Huni. And he's a much more static and comfortable player to be having on your team that's not going to cost your team the games. And if you want to invest some time into building him up and playing around him, he has shown that he is consistently a good player when ahead and is a serviceable player when behind. So, all in all, I think that is just something you need to look into statistically. He also has a decent pool. You know, while three to four champions is not a big pool, they're not going to focus him. Because your carry on your team now is going to be Froggen or Johnson, and people now know Johnson needs to be respected. Up, You know, you got to get rid of his Aphelios, and his, he's shown that he can play Senna, he can play the meta picks. Like, you got to be careful of this. He could play Kaisa. Like, Johnson's actually a threat. Nobody's going to really expect that from Fake Godin, which means you're probably going to get one of his picks, and you can prioritize his Aatrox into whatever, because he knows how to play the Aatrox. You could prioritize an Orn if you wanted, if Aatrox is gone. And, like, you just kind of work around his pool or start adapting his pool to what your team needs him to play, and all of a sudden you have a really, really strong team now. Your weak points are shored up. You've gotten rid of the crap jungler. You've gotten rid of the inconsistent top laner. And you fix the th the two huge problems, the glaring problems on the team, and have now made a team who, while the last team almost made it to playoffs, is now definitely a contender for playoffs. You have three really strong players, a pretty good jungler, and a serviceable top laner. Well, guys, this has been my kind of viewpoint on Dignitas with a long-winded explanation from what they were to what they are and what I think they can be. Um, if you guys have differing opinions on this, please leave comments down below. Let me know how you thought about this video. If you like this kind of rant style in the podcast, I'll kind of, kind of go out on these again. Uh, I like doing kind of takes on what I think are good choices for teams. So if there's any other teams that start doing shakeups and stuff like that and you want to see me do videos on them, either come back to this video and give me a comment, PM me. Um, you can find me on my Twitch all the time. You can send me messages on Twitter. Um, you know, just kind of shout out to me and I'll get to it. Like, I have a lot of different opinions on a lot of different things and I kind of want to get them out there anyways. And I have a lot of time to kill right now with the, like, with the lockdown and being unemployed. I have definitely a lot more time on my hands. So, um, hit me up guys. Like, subscribe, do whatever you want to do. Um, and I'll catch you guys in the next video and I hope you all have a wonderful, wonderful day.